everybody. I can't see you, but hello. This is called an angry black woman's rant on the future of STEM education for a reason. So bear with me. First of all, okay, first of all, I just want to thank TEDx for feeling that I had some idea worth spreading. And uh, when I was preparing for my talk, and those who know me know I get really passionate about what I say, someone asked me, have you ever been told you're an angry black woman? I said, I don't think so. Don't I look nice up there having my bun? And I'm, I don't look angry. So I really sat and I thought about, well, that's a perception people have of us. Those of us who make it despite the odds, sometimes we come off a little angry. So I just want you to humor me. If you hear that, just forgive me. So I want to put that up front. Um, I'm not angry, I'm just passionate. And when you hear my story, you'll see why what I'm talking about really matters to me. Okay, I want to tell my story a little bit. They say, tell your story. So I'm going to tell my story. I grew up in Washington, D.C., a very urban area at the time. And throughout my school career, I was placed in what you would call low track classes. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Low track class. And when I got to the seventh grade, it was, it was considered junior high at the time, and they ranked your class based on your grades or sections or whatever, and I was in seven six. Now, there were only seven sections, which meant my section was the one below the last. Now, this is critical because something happened in that class. Someone realized she shouldn't be here. She actually has some talent, so we want to move her on up to the east side, which was 8-1. Now, when I went to 8-1, I had access to a different kind of education than I did in 7-6. Particularly, the STEM education I received, the math teacher that I had, we did very rigorous mathematics. Now, I was fascinated at the idea of expanding a Pascal triangle at a as a 13-year-old. And I actually figured it out, and I understood it, and my teacher said to me, she said, Ellington, you're a genius. Now, I don't know if I really was a genius, but something about what she said and something about what I had access to changed the game for me. I started to see myself differently just by having an opportunity to engage in rigorous STEM education. Now let's fast forward my story. That's me. So <laughs> I graduated ninth grade. I was the third top student in my class. Fast forward, I went to a regular high school, Spingarn. Anybody from D.C. know what I'm talking about? Um, I went to Spingarn Senior High School. There, my father advocated that I took a calculus class that didn't exist. So one of the teachers was gracious enough to use their planning period to teach me calculus. Fast forward, I, became, I was the valedictorian of my class, full scholarship to Morgan State University, got a master's in mathematics, and ultimately a Ph.D. in math education. Now, I don't share that with you, y'all supposed to clap, but I'm not sharing that with you. <laughs> I'm not sharing that to you with you to brag <laughs> on what I've accomplished, but I share that with you because what I study is intimately connected to my experience as an African-American woman that was happened to be born on the wrong side of the tracks and wasn't predictably to be here, okay? Now, you say, well, Ronnie, why are you angry? Why are you angry? You, you're doing something, right? Well, what I found once I got to the promised land, once I finished my PhD and I was out there trying to make a difference, what I saw was very few people that looked like me who had the experiences that I had. And they, when I talked to people about transforming STEM education, most of them could not relate to the experiences of a little black girl that grew up in the basement who is now here. Now, I say that with humility, but there's something about having people of diverse backgrounds at the table that actually makes the difference. I also was curious, why was I considered special? People would say, wow, you have an English accent. You do math, really? <laughs> and I said, well, what are you talking about? You went from DC, Spingarn? So I was trying to figure out, well, why am I special? And what I realized is that there was a perception of STEM disciplines, that they were hard, and that only the special could make it. And it became my life's work, even though I'm young. Y'all supposed to say, oh, her life's work? Um, <laughs> 
But it became my life's work to answer this question. What factors impact marginalized, and I use marginalized as code word for poor, brown, red, black, urban, whatever you want to call it, but those of us who normally are not in these disciplines, to persist and succeed in these disciplines and careers? That became the question that drove much of my work up to this point. So my research considers, uh, I first started my dissertation, I looked at the experiences of students who did well in math, ma as math majors, and they gave me some interesting insights on the things that they felt made the difference. Also, I looked at not just school practices, but also sociocultural practices that shape student success in math and STEM disciplines. My most recent work is on interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary learning experiences, because we believe that if you're solving a real STEM problem, you cannot do it in a silo. You must understand cross-disciplinary applications of ideas. So, like Ronnie, so what? Well, what I came up with was what I call an inclusive framework for STEM education. Now, what these students taught me was that a lot of things were happening in their lives that had them become STEM majors, do well, et cetera, but I think these things should be made explicit when we're teaching. Like, it shouldn't just be an ad hoc thing. We should be deliberate about these different factors. The first one, and the most important one, is that as STEM folks, anybody out there who does STEM work, know we are so focused on content. Sometimes we lose the people for the content. I tell people I don't teach math, I teach students mathematics. The key is students. So when we're talking about transforming STEM education, we first have to think about how do our practices support STEM identity and agency? How do we empower students to pursue hard subjects, even when things get rough. So there's some ideas I have about that. The next piece is one of my favorite pieces. I think teachers are the saviors of the world. And I don't necessarily think they're treated that way. <laughs> I believe that in order for us to have a transformative model of STEM education, teachers need to be more than content experts. They must be what I call agents of change. They must see themselves as viable vehicles for students' lives to change. And we must train them on what that takes. They are more than people that know math and science. They are people that will change lives. Okay, the next piece is one of my other favorites, is utilizing community, social, and cultural capital. What I found in my research is that when people go into so-called impoverished, marginalized neighborhoods, they feel as if they're giving them capital versus utilizing the capital that already exists. So we have to be deliberate about saying, okay, these communities have something to contribute to our students' progression through the STEM pipeline. And I think we should be diligent about finding out what that is and utilizing it. And then the last piece, which I also value, is innovative school-based practices. And you've heard some of those here. The robotics, the real-world applications, having students have access to internships. We need to think outside the book and start thinking about what are the kinds of practices and programs and curricula that really do foster the rest of these. Because of time, I just talked about identity. I would argue if people don't see themselves as STEM learners, they won't do it, no matter how good the curriculum is. So we need to say, well, how are we going to create a curriculum that changes the way a kid sees themselves, as Ms. Mitchell did for me? The next piece is, I think we need to start thinking more about transformation and not change. Meaning we need to really step outside the box and think about what is some of the things that will move our students forward. And it, gotta, it has to be deliberate. This is, teachers love you, need to see themselves as people who make the difference. Not just teachers, administrators, et cetera, and we need to ongoingly provide them the support they need to be those agents. And again, there are role models in the community, some of them we've seen tonight, that really can be used to support our efforts in schools. 
We need to break down these barriers that school is here and community is here. We are one in trying to move students through the pipeline. So you ask Ronnie, why STEM? Why not English? Psychology, those are great disciplines, but there's something about the new, the STEM innovations that will actually open doors for students that I believe need to be open for all students, not just the ones who came from the right side of the tracks. And as I close, I wanna, it's ironic, my mother passed away in 1997, the year I got my degree, my MA degree, and she passed away, and today is her birthday. I just, yeah, clap for my mama. Today is her birthday, and uh, I don't want to choke up because I'm, you know, I got makeup and things, but <laughs> I really want to just acknowledge her publicly because it was her, even though she didn't have an education, she provided a context for me to have one. So I just want to just honor her for a minute to say, you know what? You did good, Ma. So, thank you. Thanks for giving this one angry black woman an opportunity to say her piece. It's really not anger, it really is. That when I see that table that I showed you, I wanna see all kinds of people with all kinds of backgrounds being the innovators for tomorrow. Thank you.